brought. Interesting, I was commenting on books in the library here and bookstore here. I, I spent most of the morning at the RIBA. Uh, and uh, I noticed the contrast. Uh, so I counted the different titles. There were 44 titles of books about Le Corbusier, and there were 65 titles of books by <laughs> about Frank Lloyd Wright. Now, uh, of course, I had to go to the uh, manager of the bookstore and ask why that was true. Uh, and uh, I also had to comment on the fact that uh, uh, a number of people in, in my audience here are, are not sort of 18 to 25 student age, but older people. And uh, uh, the owner of the bookstore said, yeah, that's probably true. Uh, it, it's uh, slightly uh, older people who uh, have discovered Frank Lloyd Wright and appreciate his work, whereas uh, people who are studying architecture in their teens and their twenties uh, perhaps are more pro-Corbu. But anyway, that's another aside on the subject. And uh, <coughs> uh, so we'll get underway uh, with this period, having looked at those uh, major buildings of 36, 37, and 38, <coughs> that is to say, Falling Water on the Johnson Wax Building, and that one house based on uh, 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 hexagonal forms. Uh, now we move only one year ahead here. Of course, we looked at Taliesin last time, which was begun in 37 with the money gained from those three commissions. And then at the same time, Wright was undertaking minor residential uh, commissions uh, for what he eventually defined as his Usonian, in other words, United Statesian house. Uh, and uh, uh, the first one he built in the suburbs of Madison, uh, Wisconsin. And I show you. Uh, a photograph of it, and the upper drawing on the far screen is the same angle as the uh, photograph itself. Um, <coughs> this was the uh, Jacob's house. This is the living room. This is the dining uh, space near the li living room, and the, and the kitchen is off here. These are the bedrooms, and finally the study off here. And as we'll see, it was characteristic of all of these Usonian houses. The street side, see here's the street, here's the car port. He stopped using garages and just had a covered roof, car port, and the main wall facing the street has only these very high windows uh, to give privacy. This is concern for privacy, which is always so dominant in Wright's work. You know, something I would like to have an answer to. No one's ever given it to me. This is another side. But why is it that whenever anyone builds a house anywhere near a highway or a roadway, and I don't care whether it's a small, inexpensive house or a great multi-million dollar mansion, they always want the house to face the street. And, and when I drive around Canada and the United States and I see these houses that probably cost a half a million dollars or something, uh, they're right there uh, facing the street. Why don't they face the other direction and look at Mother Nature? What the hell's wrong with Mother Nature? Uh, I, I don't think it probably has anything to do with the fact they like to look at cars going up and down the street. Maybe that's it. I mean, four-lane highways and, and just to watch those cars all day. No, I think they want the people in the car to think, oh, that person has a lot of money. Uh, it's a terrible comment on, on uh, our <coughs> attitude towards uh, uh, architecture. Anyway, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright managed to turn his buildings uh, away from the street rather than toward the street, and you'll find this in all the examples of Wright's work. Now, the Jacobs House uh, was built by this sandwich construction. I spoke of it in the very first lecture last week, and here I show you uh, <coughs> two examples of what this, uh, this sandwich construction uh, consisted of. In other words, the interior of the sandwich was merely five-eighths inch plywood sheet, as you see here, 
On either side of that sheet would be the mayonnaise, that is to say, uh, the black roofing paper uh, on either side. And then on either side of that, just as I've always said, Wright is using the same material on the exterior as he uses on the interior of the building. So in this case, well, you can see the corner. So this is the exterior of the building, and this is the interior of the building, and you can see uh, the way he's doing it. And of course, this is a variation on, uh, on oh dear, what happened to the word, um, and slab. What's the word I want? Well, I don't need it. Uh, uh, that he is, has used in putting these boards together. Now, in the 30s, he almost he always used cypress, because, of course, cypress is a waterproof board. Uh, it lasts more or less indefinitely. It will slightly change color uh, in time, but uh, he liked to use cypress both on the outside and the inside. So here you see how he constructed it. And remember in that <coughs> slide of the Smith House, and I'm going to show you the Smith House some more uh, this afternoon, uh, to gain strength in this wall, because obviously it's very uh, uh, thin wall, five-eighths of an inch, basically, is its central element. We noticed at the Smith House how he used bookcases. He built in those bookcases against this wall to give the wall uh, strength against any movement uh, that it might uh, have. All right, so we go from. What sort of vertical height are those boards? Pardon? How wide are those boards vertically? Uh, well, the ply would be five by eight feet. Facing boards. Oh, the, well, they, they could vary, uh, but, but usually uh, approximately one foot. Uh, all right, now this. Uh, is the Smith House, M.M. M. Smith House in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, that I showed you earlier. It's actually a, a decade later than the Jacobs House that we just have seen, uh, but I happen to have much better photographs of this uh, than the uh, Jacobs House, so I want to use this as my example of a typical uh, Usonian house. Uh, this is looking at the garden side. Of course, you're immediately uh, uh, aware of the fact that this is uh, <coughs> not a private area here. Here's the living room. Uh, here is the dining room here. Uh, here is the wing to the bedroom. Uh, and if you turn around to the other side of the house, this is the street side of the house, it's just as we noted in the previous example. That is to say, Wright is closing it off against the street, just these high windows. Uh, here's the carport here. Uh, the front door is here. And again, look at the heights in this. I've, I've emphasized this over and over again, <coughs> how Wright uses different heights. You can read something about the interior of this house just from looking at these slab roofs. Uh, for example, why is this roof lower than this roof? They're both in the living room. But this roof is covering the area where you sit. There's a bench across this wall. So this is where you're sitting. This is the part of the living room where you're standing up. You say, now, why are there two different brick heights of whatever that is, a chimney or something? But they're both chimneys, really. This is the chimney for the fireplace and furnace. This bigger form is actually the chimney of the kitchen. He makes the chick kitchen ceiling always higher because he wants to have the circulation within the house pass through the house and into the kitchen and up. In other words, he doesn't want the kitchen smells to penetrate the rest of the house, but making, in point of fact, a stack, a smokestack out of the kitchen, uh, he draws not only the kitchen smells, but any other smells maybe around the house out uh, through the roof and through the uh, kitchen form. Here you can see that again. There is the fireplace chimney, and you just barely see the, the chimney of uh, the kitchen. That chimney is the full size of the actual uh, kitchen itself. Next, please. Um, now, in my very first lecture, uh, <coughs> we discussed how Wright was breaking down the uh, 
uh, traditional composition of rooms that had existed since the, well, classical era through the Middle Ages, through the Renaissance, through the uh, 18th century, 19th century, and so on. The typical uh, <coughs> corner room, uh, well, like this room, you have corners around it and so on and how Wright had broken down in those early works of his, circa 1900, uh, getting rid of the corner, uh, keeping just the walls without the corners, and how the next logical step uh, was that there's no need to keep those walls where they had traditionally been. If you don't have the corners, you don't have to join up those with corners. Uh, therefore, you can break these walls up, uh, place them in different spots, and as you can see uh, up there, that's practically the plan of the Smith House that we have on the other screen. Um, don't think I have a pointer today. Um, all right, I'm almost that tall. Um, but uh, uh, you can see these forms here are like what you see up in the upper right corner, uh, the fireplace there. It, it, these, just these different slab elements now uh, provide all the structural support that is needed for the house. You see these dotted lines are simply that sandwich construction that I was talking about, or just glass. The, what holds the roof up, what holds the house up, you see are the dark black areas you see in that uh, uh, scheme up above. So having gotten rid of these corners, he has a whole totally new way of providing support for roof forms uh, that you see in the upper part. Now combine that with uh, the, going back to the Froebel system that we talked about, so early in Wright's life, of always using a unit system, and remember that quotation that I showed you in the very first lecture uh, of the importance of a unit system for Frank Lloyd Wright. Basically, it's a, a proportional system. Uh, you can see in all of these plans, we saw it, for instance, in the Martin House in 1904, 1905 in Buffalo. Uh, here we have it in 1947. Uh, you see, 40 years later, he's still basically using this unit system uh, to give order uh, and proportion uh, and rhythm uh, to his design. Now you see uh, the top of this plan is the roadside. You can see the carport here. I don't think it's quite in focus, but that's okay. Did you find a pointer? Um, uh, no, okay. Okay. Um, and, uh, uh, okay, and when we get to the inside of the house, and I'm going to show you photographs on the inside, notice these different areas. Here is the fireplace. See, here's the entry up here, carport. You enter at this point. Uh, there are these low uh, seating area along here. That's where the lower, oh, thank you. The lower, uh, um, the, uh, the lower roof was, the lower slab roof along here. Notice this dashed line along here. That's the point at which you have the higher ceiling. Therefore, this part of the living room is really uh, the cozier part where you're sitting down and so on. Uh, this part of the living room is where you're more apt to be standing up, where you want the windows to be higher, these glass windows that go from floor to ceiling along here facing the garden, uh, et cetera. Now notice how carefully he works this out. This is not by chance, this is very careful. Uh, notice that the high ceiling uh, continues right down here. So this is, in other words, a hallway, you might say. It's a walking area, it's a circulation area. Uh, and what he always calls a workroom, uh, that's his uh, synonym for kitchen. Uh, here's the kitchen where we saw the high ceiling a few minutes ago, and across from the kitchen you have the dining room. And notice those dotted lines. You see, 
the higher ceiling goes through here. The lower ceiling is here where you're sitting and here where you're dining and then in the bedrooms as well. So carefully working out the heights of rooms and if it's on a sloping uh, piece of land, he does the same things in terms of, of uh, stepping down. He may keep the ceiling the same, but step you down in different <coughs> parts of the house. Now later, I'm going to show you some views looking out of this uh, bedroom towards the uh, terrace uh, that is out here. Uh, the overhanging roof. And something I, I want to point out, and I really came to realize when I was uh, staying here at the Smith House, uh, was how fantastic Wright uh, either gives you privacy or a greater openness after dark by the way in which he arranges his lights. And that's the last pair of slides I'll show you with regards to uh, the Smith House. Okay, uh, so you have these different, I mean, you see here, there's no basement in this house. This utility area is where the uh, uh, furnace room is for the uh, uh, heating, which is in the floor. Here's the kitchen. Uh, here's Mr. Smith's study, and here are the various bedrooms and bath, uh, and so on. Okay, next please. Now you see, here's the floor of the Smith House. Now that unit system, that rectangular unit system that I was showing you uh, in the plan, you see it's marked out on the floor. We saw it in the lecture day before yesterday uh, at the uh, uh, house in Palo Alto, California, where he used the uh, hexagon uh, and marked out those hexagon forms in the uh, floor. Again, here just a detail. This is the living room, one of the living room windows that you see here. Uh, over here would be the dining room. This shows you the exterior with the uh, cypress boarding. All of this is screwed on. <laughs> and uh, uh, Wright also insisted of all his carpenters that when he, they ended up with the screws to make sure that the, you know, each screw, of course, has a horizontal joint, <laughs> that every hor horizontal joint be horizontal uh, and not in some other direction. So all these screws would have stopped or had their uh, joint, what, I don't know what the technical word for the joint is in the, in the head of a screw, but anyway. Uh, that that's what it would be. Notice here, just as we noticed much earlier in his career, how he's emphasizing the horizontal here. He's em emphasizing the horizontal in the recessed mortar in the brickwork and the fact that the vertical joints in the brickwork are not recessed as much. Once again, to always emphasize the horizontal quality in the design. Rather interesting, this one motif you'll find always in Wright's work. Uh, I forget whether I pointed out in the interior of the Martin House in 1905, these dentals uh, to just give a sh certain shadow line. You might say that's the w one of the rare things that he has kept from classical uh, design. Next, please. Okay, here's the interior looking from the fireplace back. You can see these areas where there is brick, uh, which, and, uh, which gives support. Here's that wall uh, that faces towards, this isn't in focus, I hope the slide is, um, uh, that uh, uh, this is the roadside of the house, and here are those bookcases that I showed you in my very first lecture, and you see it is these bookcases which give I uh, shouldn't call them really bookcases. I should call them shelves because you think of a bookcase as a separate detached item. These are not detached. They're actually part of the, of the structure uh, because of how they are arranged. And here you can see where if you're sitting in these benches watching the fire in the fireplace, you have this lower ceiling. Uh, when you circulate around the room, you have the higher ceiling. Uh, when you get into this dining area, uh, you have uh, uh, a lower ceiling again. Here I used a black and white slide because I particularly wanted to show you uh, how Wright is using these uh, elements that we read as a bookcase 
uh, and indeed they serve that purpose, but they're also serving the purpose of being the structure for these very thin uh, sandwich walls. Uh, next, please. Here's looking in the opposite direction in the living room. Uh, I like this slide because uh, I'm able to capture everything. Here's the door, the front door, which leads out, you see, not directly, never in a right house. It doesn't lead directly out to the street. It leads at a 90 degree angle to the street. You come in here, uh, you come in, you see the lower ceiling. Uh, as you come in, again, that feeling of depressing you so that when you get into this part of the room, you have the feeling that it's almost a higher ceiling than it actually is. Uh, and uh, notice here is, is the uh, dining area. Notice the lower uh, ceiling in the dining area. Uh, and around here where you see the light coming out, it's actually the area of the workspace, the kitchen part of the house. And looking in the opposite direction, in other words, looking from uh, I'm standing right here taking this photograph. You're looking at the dining room table. Uh, you're looking out on their, uh, on their property, their lawn and their gardens. And here are those tall windows of the uh, living room. Here, of course, you can see the joints, those recessed mortar joints in the brickwork that I pointed out on the exterior. And of course, exactly the same materials always on the interior and the exterior of a right house. Very untraditional uh, way of uh, <coughs> uh, using materials that we find in, in Wright's work. Next, please. Okay, far screen shows you that kitchen area. I've already described uh, the fact that it is the much higher ceiling in order to draw the air from various parts of the house and keep the odors of the kitchen from going into other parts of the house, uh, the light from above. And here we have uh, the corner of the living room. Uh, I show it to you. We were looking yesterday at falling water, for instance, those uh, uh, mitered glass joints. Uh, again, this whole question of destroying the corner, uh, which we discussed from 1900 onward, always likes to destroy the corner. Um, and uh, glass is a very favorite way of doing it. That's also a, a right piece, a right sculptural piece uh, that is hanging uh, in the uh, corner. Okay, next please. Now, these are uh, two photographs I made uh, that evening. Uh, as you can see, this is obviously the garden side of the house. And looking back uh, towards uh, the bedrooms and study and so on. And the important thing is to remember what glass is. I actually had four slides. I decided to leave two of them out. But to show you what this wall actually looked like when the lights were not turned on on the outside. See, Wright has arranged lights to be either uh, on the outside of the house from the cantilevered slab roof. And if they are on and you're sitting inside the house, you see you can see out. You can see out to your terrace uh, and towards your garden and so on. Whereas if uh, you switch these lights off, then these windows become mirrors and you get a much greater sense of, of enclosure and so on. So Wright uh, leaves you those options as to uh, <coughs> what way you wish to uh, uh, have the glass function uh, after dark, whether you want it to be dissolved by his lights on the outside or to be a w black wall uh <coughs> uh, because he does not have lights on the exterior of the building. And again, look at the warm colors. I mean, this, I mean, he emphasizes warmth and hominess and, and uh, uh, in the use of, of cypress. Of course, later on, cypress became a very expensive wood and uh, he had to abandon it and use other kinds of wood, sometimes even uh, inexpensive 
pine, though in the interim he used redwood and so on, but he always liked uh, the quality of, of the natural wood, which of course never, ever, right, never, ever painted anything. You always get uh, these natural materials so that you can see the natural material, you can see the grain, you can see the grain, maybe not from where you're sitting, but I can see it very clearly here uh, when I'm standing close uh, to the photograph. Now, uh, we could go on and on and on and look at many, many different uh, uh, Usonian houses by Frank Lloyd Wright. This is the Miller House. It's in Charles City, Iowa. It's in really in the middle of, I shouldn't say that, uh, the middle of the United States of America somewhere. That's a lovely little town. Uh, and on the other side, there's a lake. You can just barely see the lake. But you can see many of those characteristics that I've, I've been talking about. Uh, this is a slightly larger and more expensive house, as you can tell from uh, the materials. The fact also that it is not near a real city, but is out in the country. Wright is not using brick, but he's using uh, local stone uh, as his masonry uh, in the support elements of this house. And next, please. Um, or, yes, again, this is uh, the Palmer House. This is in Ann Arbor, Michigan. If any of you get to the University of Michigan, which is located in Ann Arbor. This is, was one of the faculty members' houses. Uh, and people often ask me which is my favorite of all Wright's buildings. Well, I won't answer that question, but if I had one, one of his many houses to live in, I think I would take the Palmer House. Um, and uh, <coughs> I'm not gonna show it to you in great detail, just these two slides, but uh, you see, uh, you come up a hill at this point, uh, to the carport, you walk up the steps here, you go through uh, the door at this point. Again, you have, this is like what I discussed in terms of the Ward Willis House way back in 1902. You see you have a choice when you go through those doors. Do you go up three or four steps? No, you don't, because that's going to be the bedroom part of the house. But here you are led by the light coming through all those windows you turn left, you come in here, uh, and there's this wonderful fireplace here, dining room, uh, workspace, which means kitchen uh, in this, and of course the uh, unit system here is the equilateral triangle, or call it a diamond, if you put two of them together, uh, and of course uh, the unit system that Wright has used to design the house is marked out clearly uh, on the uh, concrete slab of the floor. Uh, and as I said, this is just a wonderful house. I really love it very much. And you'll see that, you can see here at this point where you come through the doors, uh, <coughs> these bookshelves and so on, they don't create a high wall. You see they just, here's where you come in, those doors are right here. Here are those steps that go up to the bedroom uh, area of the house, you see you can look over uh, this area, but you can't go there. You have to move through here uh, to get into the house and uh, have the pleasure of seeing the uh, uh, fireplace at that point. Okay, so uh, no, as I say, I, I just think it's a super house. Uh, here's a house, Bethesda. Uh, Maryland, which is a suburb of Washington, D.C. Uh, <clears throat> he built it for one of his sons. Uh, and uh, this was for Llewellyn Wright, uh, who actually was a lawyer. And you can see here, he's using a different set of, of uh, a geometric forms, not pure circles. The next house I'll show you is pure circle. But here, using segments of circle, makes a nice arrangement, as you see, a uh, view towards the garden on this very steep uh, slope, fireplace uh, over here, uh, and uh, uh, the windows 
uh, that go all along uh, this area, a porch, and so on. So just using segments of circles uh, in such a design. Or in the next one, uh, another one of his sons, uh, David Wright, uh, built this house in Phoenix, Arizona, or had his father design this house for him. And here, uh, Wright is using uh, the circular form, uh, the house, a uh, bit like the Guggenheim, you see, you, you walk up uh, to the living room, uh, which is uh, where all the windows are, this being the circulation and workspace within the house. So you see, by the <coughs> uh, 1950s, Wright is using all of these uh, different elements. If you really can remember way, way back my first lecture when I showed you uh, that uh, plan of the Cooper House, uh, which we don't even have a date for. I always date uh, 80, 87 before he went to work for Louis Sullivan. We saw in that house Wright using squares and rectangles and semicircles and one thing or another. You see, it's really not to the end of his career that he comes back to uh, the, all of these forms uh, and uh, finds some way uh, in which to express them uh, in the various buildings. Uh, and if we just saw the David Wright house uh, in the circular form here, the Sugarloaf Mountain uh, objective, uh, the full title is Sugarloaf Mountain Automobile Objective. Uh, this was Sugarloaf Mountain, and uh, the owner of all this property wanted to build uh, an automobile objective. Remember, this is 1925 in date, uh, when cars were, uh, well, 1925, I guess. What year did the Model A finally come? Supplant the Model T. I used 26. to know, what? 26. 26, thank you. Uh, all right, so this was the era of the Model T. If the Model A didn't even come along until the year after this was designed. So in other words, this is the very beginning of uh, the automobile era for uh, the common individual uh, that could afford to buy a Model T or a Model A. I know I wanted to buy a Model T at one point and learn how, how motors worked. Uh, and unfortunately, it, it happened to be in the mid-1930s. And I got, I got $5 together. That's what I could buy one for. And I couldn't buy them. And I finally found out why I couldn't buy them. The Americans were shipping them all to Japan for scrap metal to make armaments to use against the Americans. Very intelligent. <laughs> um, but anyway, <coughs> um, like the Americans who want oil in Iraq. But anyway, um, uh, so here at the beginning of the popular automobile era, Wright is designing this, and I described it in that first lecture, as I said, uh, the automobiles uh, came up the road to the top of the mountain and then went uh, up to the very top where uh, you did sort of a number eight turn and could come back down. The interior here was a large, um, um, what am I trying to say, where you show the stars, planetarium. A large planetarium in the center. Uh, there were various uh, shops and exhibitions and so on. So this is 1925. Uh, and then Eight years later, in 19, uh, no, I I'm, I'm take that back. Uh, my m mathematics isn't very good. Uh, if that's 1925, this is 1943. Uh, so uh, uh, <coughs> make it 18 or 17 or 18 years later, when Wright was commissioned by uh, Guggenheim to uh, prepare designs for a new museum in New York City. Uh, you can see in Wright's first design for the Guggenheim in 1943 uh, that he is really basically basing it on his uh, Sugarloaf Mountain 
automobile objective. Uh, and uh, the difference was going to be that he was going to have an elevator here, you were going to go to the top, and then you would, uh, as a pedestrian, go down these various ramps. Well, as you well know, went through many, many projects uh, from this form of turning in to having in a straight outer walls to the uh, final form, next please, um, where uh, the curves become larger as they go up. And this was Wright's nearly finest final design for this building. Uh, and this is an interesting photo. <laughs> All these photographs of mine that I, I find now are becoming historic, like me. Uh, my, my birthday today, by the way. Uh, uh, I took this photograph the week that Mr. Wright died uh, in, in April <coughs> um, 79. Uh, I drove down to New York to see how the construction was going. As I say, it was about five days after Mr. Wright died that I took this photograph. So it, it gives you a very clear idea of exactly the state that Guggenheim was in when Wright died and lost control uh, of uh, its, its future. You see, it was just really the uh, entranceway uh, that they were still working on. And I'll show you a photograph of Mr. Wright up in that top rank uh, range in a few minutes. But while I've got an exterior photograph on the screen, let me go over this business of compression and release that I've talked about so often. You see how comparatively low the entrance is. Uh, you move in through here, and there are the doors way, way back here, and you move through those doors, and then you get into the uh, center of the museum, and boom, the space just explodes uh, over your head. Next, please. Okay, there's a section uh, of the Guggenheim. Uh, the entry level is here, uh, and uh, Wright's intention was that you should take an elevator up, as I suggested previously, and go down the ramps. And if, when and if you visit it, that's what I advise you to do. Of course, most people uh, do the opposite. They walk up uh, and uh, uh, then either walk down or take the elevator back down. And if you go up this first ramp, there's a large room here for very large paintings. Uh, otherwise, the uh, ceiling height of the various galleries, these interior galleries, is the same. Now, what I'm showing you here, this is a sketch that I made uh, to illustrate for you uh, this business of cantilever. Remember, yesterday we were discussing the uh, falling water house and the uh, cantilevered elements, and I was comparing uh, the falling water house with an angle iron, such as you see in the upper left-hand side there, that Wright is gaining his strength in that way. You see, he's doing exactly the same thing at the Guggenheim. Uh, this is basically uh, the angular form which gives support. I mean, it isn't just that this happens to be a railing, and this happens to be a floor. This is basic construction. Uh, this is what's holding the building uh, together. So he's uniting, as he always does, uh, structure <coughs> with use. Uh, and you don't necessarily recognize what is structure. You just take it for granted uh, that this is designed uh, because it looks good or something. But it has to do with the structure of the building. <coughs> Okay, as I say, you go into the building uh, under this relatively low ceiling. Uh, you go through the doors, and then once you get inside, I mean, just boom. I mean, this space just opens up over your head uh, and uh, creates uh, this wonderful uh, spatial impression. As you come in, if once you come in, here's that ramp I talked about going up at this point. Here's a continuation of the ramp you see here, and that's the big gallery. This is two stories high. If they want to 
exhibit large paintings, but uh, other paintings, as you can see, uh, they are displayed uh, as you see uh, it represented here. Um, Oh, right, there was lots of trouble when this was first built, uh, when it was first opened, because as I say, by the time it opened, Mr. Wright was already dead. Uh, they'd picked a director of the museum who didn't like Frank Lloyd Wright. That didn't help at all. Uh, the first thing they did is, is uh, got rid of, for instance, all living things within the museum. A later director allowed uh, living plants to come back into the museum. Uh, colors have changed, uh, all kinds of, of different attitudes towards the museum and its interior. But the slides I've shown you are the ones that I think are the closest in color and respectability to both the exterior and interior of the museum uh, that Wright himself uh, intended. Okay, <laughs> I mean, a couple of jokes. Uh, um, I mean, these were from the New Yorker magazine that you see on the far screen. I agree it's a monument to the genius of Frank Lloyd Wright, but as a museum, and you can see all the people standing there having been on these sloping uh, floors of the various galleries, they no longer can stand up straight at a cocktail party. Or I can't even read it here. Can you focus that a little more? Uh, oh, I, I'll be all right. In a, yes, thank you. I'll be all right in a moment. I'm afraid I accelerated a bit on the way down. <laughs> Someone who accelerated going down the uh, ramps of the museum. And here's, of course, the cover. Uh, and this, of course, uh, uh, much later, you see, the museum opened in, in uh, 57. And that's a museum cover of 1975 uh, of the uh, uh, interior of the Guggenheim Museum. All right, and next, please. Uh, now, uh, to mention some of the other works, uh, less perhaps well known from this very same period, uh, I want to speak of this Beth Shulman uh, synagogue uh, that Wright built near Philadelphia. It's a suburb called Elkins Park. <coughs> And uh, as you can see, my photograph here is uh, while they're still finishing uh, the building. And you can see in the plan how he's working basically with the idea of a triangular form. The idea of a triangular form being that, uh, for instance, if the wind is blowing very hard from this direction, you have the support over here. If the wind is blowing from any other direction you have support on the opposite side of the building. This is something that Wright felt very important. I showed you his uh, Romeo and Juliet a skyscraper, a skyscraper, a Romeo and Juliet windmill of 1896, uh, where he first developed uh, these ideas of using certain triangular forms uh, to deal with wind resistance. Uh, but <coughs> here, in, in the uh, Beth Shonen uh, Synagogue, uh, let's see, it's 54 to 59, it's construction. Uh, he's picking up, once again, from ideas of his earlier career. Next, please. You may remember Lake Tahoe in California that we looked at much earlier, picking up the Indian TP form. Uh, or here in an, the late 20s and, and up to 31, he was working on this uh, so-called steel cathedral. It was to be a massive uh, building, uh, taller than the Empire State Building in New York. Uh, and again, you see, he is using this TP uh, shape uh, with the glazing. And certainly, the Beth Shonen Synagogue is an example of his picking up <laughs> Uh, finally being able to get a, a commission to realize a certain one of his ideas, admittedly uh, at a much smaller scale uh, than the Steel Cathedral was the Beth Shonen Synagogue. But at least he was able to get an example of that idea uh, executed. Here's the interior of it. 
Here it is, uh, I show it to you while it was still under construction, you saw the exterior of it. At that moment, uh, you can see the uh, means of lighting uh, that he intended to use. Uh, here you see the, uh, the interior after construction was uh, complete uh, and the arrangement of the interior uh, in this, this very luminous uh, and yet very private interior space uh, of the synagogue. Here you see the exterior of the same building. Here you can clearly see uh, how he arranged it. These are lights at night. They can be lit uh, like torches or candles, uh, sending up uh, a stream of light uh, from these various sources. Okay, so right still uh, here in the 50s, uh, constantly uh, utilizing earlier ideas uh, in creating his, his various designs. Next, please. Yeah. And here's another one. I've mentioned this before, but not shown it to you before. Uh, this building was almost complete when Wright died in 57. Um, so, I, I mean, uh, there's no question Oh, but if you go to it today, don't look at it today. Uh, this is a Greek Orthodox church in Wauwatesa. Uh, <coughs> uh, what am I trying to say, Wauwatesa? Um, it's not soda. Uh, uh, because uh, recent uh, uh, pastor, or whatever you call him in a Greek Orthodox church, uh, has taken out all rights glass windows and filled them in with decorative windows, uh, which has just totally destroyed the appearance of the building. Um, but anyway, you can see here uh, that he bases it on a circle. Think of the David Wright house that we took, saw, or the Sugarloaf uh, Mountain Automobile Objective, or the Guggenheim Museum, uh, Wright working with a circle. You can see how he was planning the seating area of the interior. Uh, there certainly is uh, Near Eastern uh, influence here in the color of the dome, uh, going back to uh, Moorish or other architecture and, and the reflective quality of this dome, especially when you have a blue sky uh, overhead. And next, please, uh, remember I mentioned this building uh, to you, I guess it was in, in Monday's lecture, when I showed you this bowl at a great distance in the Taliesin drafting room, uh, because I, I was actually uh, going to the dedication of the church, and I stopped at Taliesin uh, for a couple of days before uh, going over to Wauwatesa. And uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, drafts, one of the fellows, Taliesin fellows in the drafting room, and when I said I was going over to the uh, dedication of the Greek Orthodox Church, he, he pointed to this bowl, which I showed you in the photograph the other day, right beside Wright's desk. And he said, okay, you're going to see this bowl when you go to the dedication. He said, Mr. Wright liked that bowl very, very much. He always kept it close to his uh, desk. And uh, the idea of a circular uh, and closure of space is what he thought would be ideal for the Greek Orthodox Church. Now, how much of that is true? <laughs> uh, no one can prove unless one takes a survey of all the uh, uh, fellows who were in uh, the fellowship at that time, but I, I, I can see that that's true. I mean, there's so much in right that he takes from uh, objects, uh, and particularly Asian objects, uh, that are around him uh, that he uh, uh, incorporates in his architecture. Well, no one is going to take that, but the idea of enclosure of space, that's obviously what a bowl or a vase uh, is all about. All right, so this is the interior. Uh, here you're looking towards uh, the altar. Uh, these old slides of mine, I'm afraid, these show their age. Uh, but uh, 
uh, and then looking across at the congregation area, as I say, all these windows, unfortunately, have been changed now, uh, and you get a very different color scheme and pattern. Think of the, uh, that little wooden decoration hanging in the corner of the M.M. M. Smith house that we looked at a few moments ago, and then think of, of these light fixtures that Wright has, has designed here. Anyway, uh, it's an absolutely uh, fascinating uh, conception and the way in which he has uh, introduced those round gl glass objects just under the ceiling. He wants you to feel that that low ceiling is, is floating uh, over your head. He doesn't want you to feel that it has any great weight and you only have that gilded gold sky overhead. Okay, now uh, the Greek Orthodox Church was not quite finished when Mr. Wright died. Uh, this is an example of a major work that hadn't even been started when Mr. Wright died. I don't mean the plans weren't prepared, but the construction was not started. This is the Marin County. Now, if you're in, in uh, San Francisco, <coughs> you've probably heard of the Golden Gate Bridge, which leads from San Francisco across uh, to the north of San Francisco. That's Marin County. And uh, the Marin County buildings, in other words, you could call it town hall if you want to, uh, uh, were built uh, on a, a site uh, on uh, that north side of, of the uh, Golden Gate Bridge. Here's a model of how it was to develop. My um, two slides here, uh, actually, again, this is my photograph. Uh, it's taken from right up here. I was standing here when I took the photograph. And uh, you can see you're looking down here now these are all the administrative offices uh, for the uh, uh, county building, the town hall, whatever you want to call it. Well, it's not a town, it's the whole county of Marin. Uh, and uh, then this long wing, which was constructed two or three years later, but designed by Frank Lloyd Wright, is that which houses all the uh, uh, legal aspects of it, all the courtrooms, the court uh, uh, offices, all the uh, lawyers and judges' offices and so on are in the wing that you see here. Uh, joining the two is, of course, something that <laughs> will remind you of the Greek Orthodox Church that we've just seen, uh, and uh, uh, this is actually a library. And again, it has sort of a gilt ceiling like we saw in, in the church. Downstairs and on the far side, there is a courtyard and, and a restaurant and so on, uh, which joins up these two parts. And then other buildings were to be built later along this area for various exhibitions uh, of different types. And again, you can see what Wright has done. They, of course, expected that he was going to locate a building uh, between the hills. But you see, he's picked up the idea of a Roman aqueduct, and he's carrying the building, building like an aqueduct. And thus, you have, of course, all these forms that we'll recall uh, a Roman aqueduct. Uh, and he's connecting uh, the uh, uh, hilltops uh, with the building, uh, just as you would have uh, an aqueduct carrying the water uh, <clears throat> around this varied uh, landscape. Now, there were certain changes obviously made since Wright was not on the scene. Uh, the Taliesin Fellowship made certain changes. The central roof portion uh, was to be open. It got closed uh, and certain minor changes. But let's face it, it, it's very much Frank Lloyd Wright, even though the entire construction took place after his death. Here again, you can see this uh, wing, and this is the uh, administrative wing, the town, uh, the county offices along here. Uh, the, you just barely see the roof of the library here. Uh, this form, uh, which includes 
smokestacks and so on, and then running around the exterior uh, along here is a corridor uh, that you see in this slide uh, looking out onto the area. Oh, Frank Lloyd Wright also designed the post office, which is right at the bottom of, of the hill, and uh, you can communicate by this outside passageway uh, down the uh, length of the interior. Um, so now we have gotten to a point after Frank Lloyd Wright's death uh, with his work, uh, and uh, this is actually the entrance to it. You can come here, you let out your car, you can, well, you can see it says exit, entrance, other side. Originally, as I mentioned, originally Wright had designed that to be open, the Taliesin Fellowship at the request of, of various people uh, enclosed it with glass, but you can see reminiscences of, of the Guggenheim Museum or whatever you want to compare it with, uh, or even falling water, uh, these circulation corridors uh, that uh, uh, bend around in the interior, and the other photograph is taken at the very top rank, uh, ramp, I should say. You can see these are the offices, the entrance to the offices on either side and you simply walk up here. And again, I'm sorry, this is an old uh, 1950s photograph, uh, and it's, it has suffered uh, a bit with age. That's not just dust, it won't come <laughs> off. Uh, <laughs> okay, and next, please. <clears throat> Couple of other views. Here you can see where the restaurant is by this pool, uh, the tower, uh, the library above, the restaurant below and uh, another view of it uh, as you see it from that side uh, of the building. Okay, um, now Wright had been interested in building a skyscraper uh, from uh, the very beginning. I mean, after all, having worked for Louis Sullivan, there was a tremendous incentive or reason to do so. Uh, the only uh, thing was that by the end of his life, he'd only executed one skyscraper. I mean, I could give a whole series of lectures on his <coughs> skyscrapers. This is the one that he executed. Uh, <coughs> it was for, the, for Mr. Price in Bartlesville, which is a little town in Oklahoma, the middle of nowhere, is flat country, uh, and Bartles and uh, the price company, man, I'm not sure what the system was, but it's for oil, oil pipelines and the way you uh, join the pipes together uh, as quickly and economically and efficiently as possible. Uh, and uh, this was a specialty of the uh, <coughs> price company. Anyway, Mr. Price uh, commissioned Wright to design uh, this uh, office building. Uh, his office was going to be right on the very top. Uh, and uh, uh, so Wright did, and it got built. I mean, here's a built building, 1950s, this final few years of his life. And notice the structure of it. Uh, very important. You see, Wright using the cantilever. The structure are these four elements. Basically, you see, it's a pinwheel. The structure is a pinwheel. It's not the outer walls of a building, is, as is traditional uh, in, in buildings, whether it be a house or a Louis Sullivan skyscraper or whatever. So what he's doing is cantilevering uh, the floors off from these four pinwheel uh, fashions. Right in the middle of the building are going to be the elevators. And three of these, if you can see, and it's not quite in focus, uh, three of these are off. That's better, thank you. Uh, three of these are office and one is a dwelling. So there were apartment, uh, um, apartments here. And uh, these were two-story uh, elevation <coughs> apartments. Um, oh, who am I trying to think of now? I can't think of the architect. Um, anyway, who lived here? Uh, and uh, so this would be the bedroom level of the... Uh, 
living unit, and you can see that dotted line along here, and the living room would be two stories high at this point. Otherwise, there were three offices on each of the floors. Uh, and the exterior of the building clearly reflects uh, the interior use of the building, because uh, where the uh, lines, you see the different lines of whether they are vertical or horizontal is a reflection of the interior use. I think my next slides show that, maybe they don't. Oh, maybe they don't, I'm sorry. The next slides actually go back historically. Remember we looked at in the 1920s, uh, the, uh, from 20, about 1924 to 1929, the St. Mark's and the Bowery's uh, project of Frank Lloyd Wright, here you see it written out. Uh, this is from Hitchcock's book, the photograph, uh, showing you this system. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, one tends to read some of these elevation, these section drawings in such a way that you get a misimpression of the structure. The structure is exactly the same. You can see here, a pinwheel with the four elements. And some people read this central element as, as structure. It is not. What you're looking at when you're looking straight on, of course, is an edge view of one of the, one of the uh, uh, blades of this pinwheel. All right, so this is basically uh, St. Mark's in the Bowery uh, that Frank Lloyd Wright finally got uh, to execute for uh, the Price family so many years later. Uh, and then at the very end of his life, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright designed, and of course this was a publicity stunt, I mean, let's face it, uh, designed this skyscraper, which was to be a mile high. Uh, I mean, it would make uh, Eiffel Tower and, and uh, anything else look like a, a tiny speck on the ground compared with this building. But of course, this is basically picking up, I should have a, a sec, uh, a plan of it, I'm sorry I don't here, uh, but a plan of this building, and this is basically, well remember going back to that slide I showed you of the interior of his library at Oak Park in, in the late, uh, uh, about 1900, that weed vase, oh by the way, I. I did I mention it? I saw one of the, his weed vases. It's practically next door. It's over at the British Museum. Um, <coughs> and uh, certainly the weed vase is one of the uh, profile uh, important elements uh, in the design of this building. See, right, always bring all these different things, whether it be bowls or vases or aqueducts or whatever it is, uh, together uh, to uh, uh, create these designs of his. And here you can see even more clearly the difference between uh, those exterior, uh, exterior portions of the building. You see each facade is different because each facade faces a different direction. Why do skyscrapers traditionally have four sides all designed the same? Doesn't it make any difference whether it's facing south in the sun or facing north and not sun? and so on. Whereas Wright designed these buildings with uh, different facades, four different facades, depending whether they were facing uh, east, south, west, or north. Uh, and also different facade according to uh, its use. If it was uh, the horizontal windows, uh, that was for, for the apartment uh, stack within. The vertical windows were for the office uh, buildings and you can't, well, yes, you can just barely see. See that slab that you see there? Well, there's a second one. You can see that one at 90 degrees to it. You see, that's, that's that pinwheel uh, cross uh, that we saw as the structure in the center of the building. And you see, he carries it right up uh, literally into the sky uh, to show you what is uh, holding uh, this building up. It is not its four walls. It's this pinwheel of four slabs uh, that do not join uh, in the center and which hold and which are the key 
uh, to the cantilevered construction of uh, the Price Tower. And next, please, talking to about all of these tall buildings. Uh, here is Mr. Wright at the top rank, uh, top range of uh, uh, the Guggenheim Museum just before it was completed, just before he died. And here's Mr. Wright uh, in, in 57, um, uh, 50, uh, 56. Uh, oh, get the date straight. Uh, 57. This is in 57. Uh, Mr. Wright standing in front of his drawing, uh, age 92 at that point, uh, standing in front of his design for uh, the mile high skyscraper. Okay, thank you very much. You've been a wonderful audience. <laughs> Happy to answer any questions you may have. Yes. Um, I am afraid I've only um, been at three of your lectures, but I get the impression that you actually met the giants of the 20th century in terms of Frank Lloyd Wright, Corbusier, Nice, and Gropius. And I just wondered which of them you enjoyed being with the most. I, I didn't meet Corbu. Oh, I mean, though I've done so much writing about Corbu, I intended to do a book on early Le Corbusier before he died. Uh, and I wanted to repeat the same experience that I'd had with Wright. Uh, but uh, I didn't finish my first book, which was The Prairie School, Frank Lloyd Wright and His Midwest Contemporaries. Uh, it was published in 72. And uh, uh, let's see, Corbu died in 65. Uh, and uh, actually, I'd finished that book on, on the Prairie School in, uh, in well, four years beforehand, uh, in 68. And <laughs> the publisher, University Press, said, no one will be interested in it. We won't be able to sell any copies of it. We can't publish it. It took me four years to get them to publish that book. And then they changed the date of my preface. And I insisted that my preface remain 68, even though they didn't. They said, well, it will look like an old book we're publishing. I said, it is. <laughs> uh, anyway, they did publish it in 72. And it's still in print. You can go down to the bookstore downstairs and buy it. Uh, it sold something like 30,000 copies after the publisher said no one would ever want to read it. Uh, and if you can get a hold of a hardcover, which is almost impossible to get a hold of now, <coughs> they're selling for over $300. Um, I mean, a collector's item. But uh, yes, uh, I, I knew Mies the best of them all. I mean, right, the best of them all. Mies the least well of them all. Uh, Gropius uh, in between. Uh, Corbu, as I say, I never met. Uh, but what I really enjoy about uh, knowing Frank Lloyd Wright is I, he had a wonderful sense of humor. And uh, uh, you never read about things like that. I mean, you read about the fact that he was an arrogant old son of a bitch or something. Uh, but uh, uh, I mean, I just found him a wonderful person to just be with and talk to and, and so on. Uh, in fact, that last photo slide I showed you of him standing beside the Mile High, uh, I, was, <laughs> I went to the exhibition when he exhibited it. Um, uh, I was working in the Art Institute of Chicago on the Perry School book at that time. And 10 days after that slide, that photograph was taken. I mean, that's a press photograph. Uh, I went to Taliesin and, and uh, talked to him about these various subjects and about uh, the Mile High. And he made several sketches for me, which I. I find it very interesting. I have them framed, of course, around the house. And when the architects come and visit, I say, 
there's a, a, an architect sketch. Can you identify it? I've never had anyone who can identify it as Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, but uh, <coughs> yeah, uh, I just found Wright just so pleasant to be with. And I realize I, I really sinned in the sense that if you're going to see a great architect, presumably what you should do is talk about his work. I almost never talked about Wright's work with him. I always went and talked about his draftsman. Now, who was that you employed in 1901? And who did this drawing for you? And those kinds of things. And I think he had every right to sort of get mad at me, and he never did. I, as I say, in hindsight, I should have just asked him more questions, that one question about the mile high. Um, and I, I think I told in this group, didn't I tell that story about my meeting Gropius once? I, I, I did? Okay, then I won't repeat myself. But, uh, I mean, Gropius was so uptight about possible influences of, of different sources and so on. Mies, of course, was much more open uh, and much more honest, uh, I mean, at least admitting uh, that he had learned a great deal uh, from Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, and, uh, uh, and, of course, sometimes it's very hard to, to discern in an architect's work uh, the uh, influence of a certain person. I was, oh dear, advanced, advantage of advanced age, you can't remember names. What is the name? I was trying to think. In, in Neuchâtel in Switzerland, an architect, very well known, I was visiting, I was, I was giving a series of lectures around Switzerland last June at the TEA and, and the university and so on. Well, anyway, I, I went to Neuchâtel and he showed me a lot of his buildings. He did a lot of school buildings and public buildings and so on. And uh, one of them I liked very much. And he said, you know what the influences are in this building? And I said, no. He said, Frank Lloyd Wright. And he said, don't you see it? And I said, no. And, and it was wonderful. I mean, we went into this area that joined the different classroom parts of, of the building. And there was this big circular area uh, where there was uh, a cafeteria and, and circulation. And he said, well, the year before I, I designed this building, I was in New York and I saw the Guggenheim Museum. He said, don't you realize that that comes from the southeast uh, ramp at the Guggenheim Museum. And that's the balcony from uh, such and such a part of the Guggenheim Museum. He went right through the build, I mean, right through this whole space. We just stood there and he went right through it. I mean, that's wonderful. I mean, here's someone who is so aware of Frank Lloyd Wright. I didn't realize he was using Frank Lloyd Wright. And the wonderful thing about it, the amazing thing about it, was that he admitted it. I mean, there's only one architect in a hundred thousand that would come forth and say, I took this detail from Frank Lloyd Wright and that ramp from Frank Lloyd Wright and the idea of a circular space from Frank Lloyd Wright. No, architects are like Gropius. No, no, never admit being influenced. Oh, you're never influenced by anyone. Yes? Who, who today, either in America or anywhere, do you feel sort of represents that kind of thinking? Not necessarily a Kelly S. and fellow, but represents that kind of thinking. It's still doing buildings sort of character, sort of philosophy that Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, unfortunately, most of the uh, Taliesin fellows who knew him when he was alive and so on are not doing <laughs> work of his quality. Uh, the people who were capable of doing outstanding work went out after a very short time, I mean a few years, from Wright's office and practiced on their own and developed uh, a good practice. I think I mentioned some of them, Alden Dow, for example, or, or uh, uh, Lautner and so on, working in California. Uh, and uh, I think that's true, that uh, if someone really has uh, a certain native genius, they, they go out on their own, they don't stick around. No, I, I, I meant not necessarily people who were fellows, but architects who are practicing today, who like the Swiss architect that you mentioned, uh, and they're not necessarily fellows, but they're 
you feel have that kind of culture behind that word? What is like that? They weren't like that. Um, is anybody like that? I mean, if somebody isn't like Will Elsa, for example, who <laughs> is not like Will Elsa, the other, yeah, the other end yeah. of the state. Well, um, see, I realize I don't know. I mean, like this, this Neuchâtel architect, I, I... Is that the man that did that one of those uh, bath, um, swimming bath building? Outside of Neuchâtel? He did his work here about that, of a Swiss architect who did extraordinary um, swimming bath. Well, if you and say his name, I'll remember. Is no. No, 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 this is someone else, yeah. Uh, I wonder, I mean, I have, you have written a great deal about Le Corbusier on the Rhine, and you, in your first lecture you were very forward, or at least you seem to be, as to which architect you consider to be the better one. Uh, I think Paragard Rhine, at least that is the way I remember your first two. And um, I wonder whether... You, how you would rate them, or how you would compare the two carriers in terms of output? Um, I mean, they were obviously both very prolific, and one gets a sense that, quite, perhaps quite literally, very long right was lower on the ground, more spread out, many more buildings, like 500, 400 houses, uh, a lot of small buildings and a few large ones, like perhaps quite a different career in this way, Mr. Cordesley. And since the other um, uh, side of this question I would be interested to know about is what do you think today about how potent Franklin Wright's uh, vision is in, in America? This is an aspect which is very rarely discussed in this country, I think, it's in the Mussolini um, uh, fellowship side of this work. Wright isn't discussed, I mean, he's a popular topic today, but he's not really discussed that much. Um, uh, that recent uh, public television film on Wright, I was so, uh, I got so annoyed with them in the process of filming it because what they seemed to be interested in was Frank Lloyd Wright's sex life more than they were interested in, in uh, uh, what he had contributed to contemporary architecture. Um, but that's par for the course, I'm afraid. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I mean, to me, there's no question in comparing the two men, Corbu and Frank Lloyd Wright. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, Frank Lloyd Wright was one of the half dozen greatest architects that's ever lived, and I think I said that in the first lecture, and that's pretty high pri praise. I mean, I start with Ictinus uh, designing the Parthenon in Athens, and, and the most recent example is, is Frank Lloyd Wright uh, in terms of greatness. Uh, you, you just mentioned that Frank Lloyd Wright actually built uh, well over 400 buildings uh, and so on. Uh, Le Corbusier didn't build that many. Um, of course, in the latter part of his life, he was building mainly these unités d'habitation, you know, these large apartment buildings. Uh, can anyone here tell me about the unités d'habitation at Brie en Forêt? See, it's been closed because nobody is willing to live in it. How about the Unité d'Habitation in, in Firmini? In, uh, it's near Lyon. Firmini is near Lyon. I think Corbusier went to jail for it. What? I think Corbusier went to go to jail for it. That I'm not aware <laughs> of. <laughs> but, but, uh, uh, you know, that was going to be closed, and then the architects at the School of Architecture, the university in Firmini, uh, put up this great battle to keep it open. <coughs> and uh, so they rented apartments in half the building, and the other half of the building has been closed, I mean, for how many decades, I don't know. Well, of course, the most expensive of the Unité d'Habitation was the one uh, near, uh, uh, near Nantes. Uh, what about that? I, that's, 
I guess I visited that about three years ago. Marseille yes. Marseille was quite a costly one. Marseille, what? Marseille was very All right, but, but this one in Nantes first. We'll get back to that. But on, on the old line of reasoning from Justin Express, probably the answer to deciding who the greatest is, is do an owner's survey. Well, the people... Uh, very, good very good point. Very good point. All right, let me finish with Nantes. I mean, the people who were living there moved out, and the last time I was there, which was either three or four years ago, it was using, being used by the city uh, um, for homeless people uh, that could come in and sleep there <laughs> at night and had no money to pay a rent. Uh, and one of you mentioned uh, Marseille. I mean, Marseille, of course, went way downhill, the Unité d'Habitation there, and that, now it's gone back uphill. It's primary architects and, and wealthy lawyers uh, who tend to live there, and some MDs, doctors. And the hotel. Uh, oh, I hate the hotel. I mean, of course, I've stayed there. But I, I mean, Le Corbusier's walls, I always feel crushing in on me. I'm very uncomfortable. The Unité d'Habitation, uh, the Swiss Pavilion in, in Paris is one of the few, and that's only a dormitory, spaces that I'm really comfortable in. Uh, and uh, the uh, chapel at Ronchamp, I'm very comfortable with. I love that building. But uh, now, you mentioned Frank Lloyd Wright's buildings. I mean, 400 of them. Tell me, which ones of them have been remodeled? Oh, the, the kitchens have been updated. I mean, ice boxes that had chunks of ice in them have been taken out and they've put in electric refrigerators. Uh, and there's been that kind of remodeling in the kitchens. But the Frank Lloyd Wright buildings don't get remodeled. You can go into hundreds of Frank Lloyd Wright buildings. And they have, for more than 100 years, served people without them feeling there's any need to change them or remodel them. And I'm not talking about just at this moment when Frank Lloyd Wright is popular, but when Frank Lloyd Wright was not popular during the 20s and the 30s and the 40s, uh, uh, people didn't remodel his buildings because they found them perfectly satisfactory. It's Le Corbusier's building. Take, uh, um, oh dear, outside of Bordeaux, Pesach. Uh, take Pesach. For, yes. You, I mean, what happened? I mean, there was a housing development. Everyone started remodeling it as soon as they moved into the buildings. Of course, now, oh, Corbu is God, uh, so we have to move those people out and restore the buildings to the way Le Corbusier had designed them. This has never happened with Frank Lloyd Wright. So, I mean, the point I would make is that Wright's architecture has proven for more than a century uh, to be uh, exactly the kind of habitation uh, that people want, whether it be office buildings or housing or whatever, whereas Le Corbusier's people move out of or remodel because they don't like them. That's why I cannot be enthusiastic about at Corbu, and I get so darn mad at these writers, these authors, uh, who talk about open space, and they use the same term uh, for describing Le Corbusier's uh, residential interiors, such as Pesac that I showed you, uh, and Wright's interior spaces. They are totally different. There is no relationship whatever between them. And you find the average architectural historian or critic using the same word to describe the interior of a Wright space and a Corbu space. It just shows the critic doesn't know what the hell he or she is talking about. And yet, yes? Um, you threw some light there about... Uh, See some what? You, you, you threw some light on the oriental aspect. Uh, yes. You know, the influence of Catholic and George Wright, especially about the synagogue and the oriental law. Can you throw some more for the light on any other similar situations where it's come across in your style? Oh boy, he's asking me to sh throw some more light on, on uh, how Wright picked up various ideas from different cultures and times yeah, and places. Well, that's a big subject. I mean, uh, he spent a lot of time in Japan, didn't he? 
Oh, yes. Oh, a great deal of time in Japan. Uh, that's a debatable subject. I mean, he always insisted he was not influenced by Japanese architecture, but only by Japanese prints. Uh, and uh, it depends a bit on your interpretation. I'm willing, uh, oh, there's an excellent book on Frank Lloyd Wright and Japanese art. Newt is the author. That's a brilliant book. It's one of the really great, one of the rare great books that's been published on Wright recently. And that's five or six years ago. Um, uh, and uh, um, yeah, I mean, let's face it, those roof forms of Wright have a close parallel with, with the Japanese forms. Uh, I expect he probably was influenced by it, but that's one thing that he was really hept on, uh, insisting he was not influenced by. Yeah, any other questions? Yes? Did you used to um, experiment before you had an idea? So that you had sort of vision that you knew what it looked like before you built it? And if so, how did you go about that? Well, I mean, in, it was always done in his head. Uh, and there's this famous. Are you suggesting we're supposed to leave here? Okay, can, can we have five more minutes or not? Two more minutes. Well, it's nice to have an audience that's so willing to sit around. There's a lecture waiting outside. Oh, there's a. Uh, uh, okay, well, I guess we have to break it up. AA, you see, doesn't like Frank right around. <laughs> Okay. Thank you, you, you weren't here yesterday. I brought some gifts for your son. Oh, how kind of you. They came in my cereal boxes. Oh, isn't that marvelous? <laughs> He's going to be absolutely delighted. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much.